Lynn, and this is my talk, The Changing Face of Makeup. So what are some associations that you have with the word makeup? Maybe you think of something really natural, or maybe you think of something more glamorous, like a pinup girl. Or maybe you think girls who wear makeup are maybe trying to hide something that you don't want to see. <laughs> or maybe you just think makeup's kind of tacky. But do you ever think of anything like this, or even like this? And that's where I'm headed. So through most of human history, makeup was very natural because it was just minerals and whatever people could really use. And in the 1800s, Queen Victoria declared that makeup was improper for women to wear because it was mainly worn by actors and prostitutes, and neither of those were really reputable professions, especially back in the mid-17th century. So makeup didn't come into common use until the early 1900s because movies started being made. And of course, actors have always worn makeup because you need to see all their features from the back row of a theater. And this was especially important in black and white silent movies because they didn't have any dialogue and you needed to see all of their features so that you could tell what they were trying to say. And as soon as film was really established as a medium, people wanted to make it fantastical and go beyond the bounds of what we can really do with reality. So if you've seen Hugo Cabret or read it, you'll be familiar with this, but the George Millet film, A Trip to the Moon, you can see they had an actor with a lot of makeup and probably whipped cream or something and a backdrop, which combined created this illusion that otherwise would not be possible. Around the same time, there's a man named Lon Chaney, who he's known as the man of a thousand faces. And he really changed the way movies were cast, because before him, if directors needed someone who was crippled for their movie, they would hire someone who was crippled. Or if they needed someone really old, they would hire someone really old. And Lon Chaney showed that with the right actor and the right tools, you can really have whoever you want for your movie. He did all of his own makeup, and his most famous is probably The Phantom of the Opera. And he used very basic materials. He used wax for the teeth and then cotton balls and fake skin to shape his face. And for that famous nose, he used a piece of fish skin attached with spirit gum to pull it up. And there are stories of women fainting in the aisles and people screaming when the phantom takes off his mask and this grotesque face was revealed because no one had ever seen anything like that and no one had even imagined that that could be possible. He played a lot of very famous roles. He was also Frankenstein, the Hunchback of Notre Dame, and Wolfman. And these basic techniques are really what we still use today. They've just developed more over time and gotten more fancy, I guess you could say. And in the 1970 movie, A Little Big Man, Dustin Hoffman plays a boy who's raised by Indians and then fights in Custer's Last Stand. And it was about 30 when he was filmed, but it's told in flashback when he's 120. And so all of that is just created with latex and shadowing. And being able to do this lets you use the same actor for the same part throughout a movie, which gives a continuity to the film that you otherwise wouldn't have. And you can see there's definitely a lot of artistry involved, and it's more of a sculpture than just what you think of as being traditionally makeup. And these same techniques are also used in a lot of theater productions. If you're familiar with Wicked, you know that there's a green witch. And there's also a professor named Dr. Dillamond who happens to be a goat. And so the prosthetic they use for him is very complex, but he needs to be able to speak through it, sing through it, and still have facial expressions. And the level of artistry involved is pretty high. And it also needs to look realistic, even if you're sitting 10 feet away in the front row of the theater. And the same attention to detail is used in, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this, The Walking Dead. My makeup, or the makeup is my favorite part of the show. <laughs> I'm kind of iffy on the storyline, but I think what they do is incredible. And they don't use any CGI for the zombies. They just use makeup, and then they add in special effects when they get shot or something like that. And there's a team of four permanent makeup artists, and it takes about an hour to an hour and a half just to do one person. And so if there's six walkers in the woods, they'll all have a very high level of detail. But then if there's a city scene where there's 70 or 80, then the further away from the camera, the less detail the makeup gets. And you can see on our zombie movies throughout the years, we've gone from this, Night of the Living Dead, in the 60s, to this, in about 50 years. 
And that's pretty incredible, I think. And so you can really see that makeup is a pretty common media, and it's not that complex, or it can be, but that doesn't make it any less special just because it's a simple material. And like Roy Lichtenstein and his comic book art, we can see that with enough talent and creativity, makeup can become an art of its own merit. Thank you.